Hi, everyone. So let's move on to part two of this two part series uh, on capillary surfaces. So let me recall that in the first part, we saw some basic definitions on Riemannian geometry, and I gave you the, the, the variational definition of capillary minimal and CMC surfaces. And we also discussed a little bit about the stability of these surfaces, which gives you a way of understanding how many different independent directions we can perturb the surface so as to decrease its energy. So in this part, we're gonna see some old and new results on the theory of capillary surfaces. Let me start with a, a very basic and interesting question. So suppose we are given a fixed a Riemannian uh, three manifold M uh, with, a, with a given metric, which, which gives a, the geometry of M. And we are asking, what are the possible topological types of surfaces, sigma, that admit a capillary minimal or CMC embedding into M? So this is a very reasonable question to ask. And another uh, question is if it's possible to characterize the geometry of the allowed types, namely, uh, if we admit a capillary minimal or CMC embedding, what is the geometry of such embeddings? So the first results in, in, in the way to answer these questions uh, were obtained by uh, Nietzsche, who proved in 1985 that every immersed capillary minimal or CMC disc in the unit ball of the Euclidean space must be either totally geodesic or a spherical cap. And by a spherical cap, I mean just the intersection uh, of a sphere with a half plane, with a half space in, in R3. So this was obtained in 1985 and later in 1997, uh, Antonio Ross and Swam proved that every immersed capillary minimal or CMC disc in a ball or of every space form, simply connected space form of a three, three dimensional simply connected space form must be totally umbilical. So this generalizes the previous theorem by Nietzsche. So the closed balls are the first ambient you want to work on because they are, you know, basic uh, in the theory and such a simple environment to work on. And in the same paper, uh, Tony Ross and Swam also proved that every immersed capillary stable uh, CMC surface of genus zero in a closed ball of a three-dimensional space form must be totally umbilical. So notice the difference between the second and the third theorem in this slide. Whereas in the, in the second theorem, you have uh, an immersed capillary mineral or CMC disc. In, theorem, in, the, in the third theorem, you have a, a capillary stable surface of genus zero. So it can be an annulus or, or the genus zero surface with an arbitrary number of boundary components. But the theorem says that if this surface is capillary stable, uh, CMC in, in a ball of these space forms, then it must be totally umbilical. Okay. Uh, so, very recently, uh, Wang and Chia generalized this, this, this previous result in a, in a very surprising way and answered a, a conjecture. And he, they showed that every immersed capillary stable uh, compact hypersurface, so any dimension in, in co dimension one, in a closed ball of the space form is totally umbilical. So they removed the condition of being. Uh, uh, genus zero because it doesn't make any sense of being genus zero in higher dimensions. 
and they proved that any compact stable the CMC hypersurface in the ball is totally umbilical, generalizing the, res the previous results by Ross and Nietzsche. So this is a very remarkable uh, theorem by Wang and Chia was they proved in 2019. So there are many other types of rigidity results such as the ones I presented now. And let me mention some other uniqueness results that you can, I, I put the references here in, in the bottom of the page so that you can have a look at that if you want. So Agnus and Swarm proved some rigidity results in slabs. Choi and Koiso and also Park uh, some proved uh, results in wedges. So, you know, uh, a pair of intersecting planes in R3 uh, and the boundary of such surfaces lie in, in these two planes. Lapis proved some results on cylinders and Ritore and Rosales uh, showed some results in cones. And there are many, many others, uh, many other authors, authors and results that uh, investigated th this kind of problem in, in other ambient manifolds, okay? So let me show you some uh, new results. Uh, this, this res these results were obtained uh, in my PhD thesis, uh, and I'll present to you now. So let's fix a, let's fix a Riemannian three manifold with boundary. Let's call it M. Uh, and let sigma be a properly immersed compact surface inside M. So we're not fix we are fixing the immersion, but we are just thinking that uh, the immersion is just the inclusion of sigma in, inside M, just not to uh, carry on with the notation of that phi we used in the previous lecture. And let's fix also an angle between zero and pi, which will be the contact angle uh, between sigma and the boundary of M. So, Following Lucas Ambrosio's work on rigidity theorems for, for free boundary surfaces in some mean convex three manifolds, we can define this functional on the space of all properly immersed compact surfaces on N. So assume that the scalar curvature and the mean curvature of the boundary of M are bounded below. So M doesn't need to be compact. Uh, at, at, at first, but we are assuming these hypotheses on the curvatures. And we define this functional, co I call it I of theta. Uh, it, it acts on the properly immersed compact surfaces. And it, it's, it's a sum of two quantities involving the area uh, of, of the surface, the length of its boundary, and the curvatures of the ambient manifold. So it's it appears naturally when you apply uh, the stability inequality for stable minimal surfaces. So it's, it's a natural quantity to, to write. And we will always assume these hypotheses on the curvatures of the ambient manifold, it's namely that they are bounded below so that we can make sense of this function. So, let me uh, recall you that uh, Lucas Ambrosio showed that if you have a stable free boundary minimal surface, then this quantity for theta equals pi over two is bounded above by the Euler characteristic of your, of your surface sigma. And in fact, we, can, we showed a, a very similar theorem. Uh, I call it theorem A that if you have a compact two-sided capillary stable minima surface with a contact angle equal to theta, then this functional uh, is bounded by the topology of the surface. And so in the, in the left-hand side, as 
very interesting theorems in geometry occur. Uh, in the left-hand side, you have a purely geometrical quantity, whereas, it, whereas in the uh, right-hand side of this inequality, we have something completely topological that doesn't uh, require any metric of sigma. So in this point of view, this is an interesting uh, inequality. And we can also characterize equality. So equality in this formula here holds precisely when sigma is totally geodesic and the geodesic curvature of the boundary of sigma inside the boundary of M is equal to uh, the cotangent of theta times the infimum of the mean curvature of the boundary of M. Also, if the quality holds, then the scalar curvature of the ambient manifold is constant along the surface. Uh, and the mean curvature of the boundary of the ambient manifold is constant along the boundary of sigma. And finally, the Ricci curvature of M in the direction of the normal vector field of sigma is equal to zero. And the second fundamental form of the boundary of M is equal to zero in the direction of Nubar, which I will call you is the conormal to the boundary of sigma inside the boundary of M. And uh, in particular, uh, items one, two, and three imply that sigma has constant Gaussian curvature, of course, because of, because of uh, item two. Uh, and uh, the boundary of sigma has constant geodesic curvature uh, equal to that infimum over sine of theta. This infimum here over sine of theta. So this is a generalization of that result by Lucas Ambrosio for free boundary stable minima surfaces. And so, uh, surfaces which satisfy one, two, and three, uh, we'll, uh, we'll call them, uh, following Ambrosio's work, uh, infinitesimally rigid minimal surfaces. But let me just give you a sketch of the proof of this theorem. So the proof is quite simple. Uh, we used Gauss equation, which I wrote in this form here, so the, the left-hand side is the, the scalar function, which, which uh, uh, appears in the stability operator, in the Jacobi operator. So uh, we also use this identity here, with, which is proven with basic uh, Riemannian geometry. Uh, and we apply the stability inequality, uh, since the, the, our surface is stable, we know that the, 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 the index form is positive semi-definite, and we apply this to function equal to one, and then we invoke gauss bonnet theorem. And this proves basically most of the theorem, and the rigidity part just comes from analyzing the intermediate inequalities you, you obtain from this stability inequality here. So it's, it's a not, difficult, not a difficult theorem to prove, but it's, it's interesting because it relates a geometrical quantity with a topological one. Right, as I, I was telling you before, uh, a compact two-sided surface, which is properly embedded in M with some contact angle, and which satisfies the previous conditions, conditions one, two, and three of the theorem, we call them uh, infinitesimally rigid. And there's a, a beautiful fact that a neighborhood of these surfaces inside the ambient manifold is actually can be foliated by CMC capillary surfaces. So we have this simple proposition here, which is what I just told you. If sigma is infinitesimally rigid, then there exists a capillary CMC foliation with contact angle equal to theta. All whose leaves have, have contact angle equal to theta, which is the, the initial angle of the surface. Uh, and this foliator neighborhood of the surface and all the leaves are isotopic to sigma. 
relative to the boundary. Um, so this is a, a basically an application of the implicit function theorem. The foliation is constructed by means of choosing a vector field in M, which is tangent to the boundary of M and which has a normal component equal to one uh, long sigma. And we take the local flow of this vector field uh, to deform the surface in a adequate a way, in a proper way, so that every leaf has a CMC curvature. And the way to do this is just choosing a cleverly choosing a sub map uh, from the surface cross an interval to M through the flow of this vector field uh, and apply the implicit function theorem. I will not present the details because uh, I don't have too much time to, to, to talk about this, but it's a, sort of a standard way to define these foliations. And it, it's also uh, possible to prove another version, which is, is similar to the previous one. But now the foliation we obtain is minimal. So every leaf is minimal, but now the contact angles are allowed to vary from leaf to leaf. They are constant along the boundary of each leaf, but they are allowed to vary uh, from leaf to leaf. So this is basically the same idea of the previous one, but we now have to choose some different spaces and a different clever function to apply the implicit function theorem. So these two propositions, propositions one and two, can be used to prove uh, what I call theorem B, uh, which says the following thing. So let's suppose we have a, a three-dimensional Riemannian manifold with non-empty boundary, of course, and we assume that the boundary is mean convex. So the, the mean curvature of the boundary is non-negative at every point. So let us fix uh, now as a sigma, uh, an infinitesimally rigid surface, which, uh, are, which is now energy minimizing which means that every, every, every surface which is close to sigma has energy greater or equal to the energy of sigma. Recall the energy we defined in the first lecture, which is given in terms of, of the area functional and the wetting area functional. So let's assume one of the following hypotheses, uh, either A or B, or both, of course. But A says that each component of the boundary of sigma is locally length minimizing in the boundary of M. So it's a, it's a stable geodesic in the boundary of M. Uh, and, but more than stable, it's length minimizing. It's a, a local minimum of length inside the boundary of the, of the ambient manifold. So we assume either this or we assume that the infimum of the, the mean curvature of the boundary is zero. So under one of these conditions, we have the following results. Either the capillary angle is equal to pi over two, so we, either we have a free boundary uh, stable minimal surface, or if theta happens not to be equal to pi over two, then a rigid, a rigid uh, thing occurs. Sigma is a flat surface, so has zero Gaussian curvature, and is a totally geodesic cylinder. And moreover, M is flat around sigma, in the neighborhood of sigma, and the boundary of M is totally geodesic around the boundary of sigma. So this is a very particular uh, uh, occurrence uh, a particular case that occurs in when we assume uh, the hypothesis of this theorem. In the first case, uh, Lucas Ambrosio and showed that, and this is the second part of the theorem, which is basically shown by Lucas Ambrosio, that a neighborhood of sigma inside the manifold M is isometric to a product. So we have a local splitting uh, theorem 
uh, around sigma when it's free boundary. So this theorem is just giving us a, a sort of a, a rigidity result. And you may ask if uh, the second option may occur, for, its, for instance, is, is, is there a chance for sigma to be flat and totally geodesic cylinder and the ambient to be flat and totally geodesic around sigma? And uh, I want to present here an example of, of a possible occurrence of this situation. So suppose we have uh, three planes in R3, and I'm, I'm drawing here uh, the picture seen from a 2D perspective. So suppose we have plane P1 and P2 that intersect at the line L. It can be the origin for L can, can contain the origin of, for example, and take a, a, re, a region uh, 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 contain uh, in, the inter in the middle of these planes and the wedge called S. And now take a plane Q, which is parallel to the line L. As, and in such a way that it intersects the planes P1 and P2 in, in angles theta. So we have this isosceles triangle here. So we have this wedge S. Uh, and now we consider uh, a group of translations in R3, which are translations parallel to the line L. And we take uh, our manifold to be the quotient of S in R3, which is an open, an open wedge by this group of translations uh, for, its, for example, of vector of unit length. Then, uh, the quotient of the, the part of Q, which is inside this wedge by this translation, is exactly a totally geodesic uh, flat cylinder. Uh, the boundary of our manifold is, of course, totally geodesic. Uh, but one thing I, I don't know for sure, if this surface inside the quotient is energy minimizing. It certainly is uh, infinitesimally rigid, but I'm not sure if it's uh, energy minimizing. And that's one thing I would like to know. So this is a possible example of uh, that particular situation in theorem B. Okay. Perfect. So let me show you just a sketch of the proof of this theorem. By the, the propositions I mentioned before, there exists a local foliation around an infinitesimally rigid surface. So let G be a map from this product to M, which parameterizes this foliation, which is a capillary CMC foliations. The leaves I call a sigma T, where T varies in a small interval around zero. And I call rho T the normal component of this variational, so-called variational vector field of, of, of G uh, in each leaf. So since uh, this row zero is equal to say one, uh, if we choose uh, G carefully, then we can assume row T is positive for all T uh, in a maybe smaller neighborhood of zero. And it's possible to, sh to choose to, to show this, this identities for the derivative of the mean curvature of the leaves in terms of the Jacobi operator of the leaves and the, the derivative of this so-called lapse function in terms of that uh, function, which I called Q in the first lecture. Here, Q, QT, rho T. So if we divide the first equation here by rho t and then integrate by parts, oh, we have uh, some long computations to, to make and you, we apply the hypothesis of the, of the theorem and we arrive at, so, at this uh, huge differential inequality here. So the rest of the proof is basically uh, analyzing this differential inequality and seeing what happens in the different cases for instance, if 
this infimum is positive or if this infimum is negative or if this infimum is equal to zero, then we analyze each case separately and infer the what we wanted to show in the theorem, right? I, I, I will not present every detail here. I just wanted to give you a small idea of, of the arguments, but it's basically some analysis on this differential inequality over here. Okay, great. So the last result I want to, to, to tell you is a result which uh, relates the geometry of capillary surfaces with its topology. And so it expects to be a, a reasonable and a beautiful result because of this interplay between geometry and topology. And I, I should mention that this is in, inspired by the, word of Ch, uh, by the work of uh, Chen, Fraser, and Pang. Um, and it's, it's part of, uh, part of the theorem is a generalization of this, of, of, of a theorem of these uh, three people. And it says the following, I call it theorem C. So as always, let's fix a, an oriented Riemannian manifold with boundary. Uh, and let sigma be a compact orientable now, capillary minimal surface of some genus gamma greater or equal to zero, and having a K boundary components. So K is greater or equal to one. And it's immersed in M with some contact angle equal to theta. So we have three alternatives in, in this theorem, three parts, no alternatives. They are not mutually exclusive. So the first one, we suppose that the Ricci curvature of M is non-negative and that the mean curvature of the boundary is non-negative. So if sigma has index one, then we're able to show that the total geodesic curvature of the boundary of sigma is less than a topological constant that only depends on the genus and on, on the number of boundary components of sigma. Uh, in particular, if the total geodesic curvature is non-negative, so if this is non-negative, then the right side is also, it is positive. Uh, then we have this options A or B, either gamma plus K is less or equal to three if G is even, uh, if G, uh, I'm sorry, is, if gamma is even, or uh, gamma plus K is less or equal to four if gamma is odd. So this happens, for instance, if we have a free boundary minimal surface, and if the boundary of the ambient is weakly convex. Uh, in fact, we can show that if this is the case, then we, the, 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 the left-hand side of this inequality is always positive, uh, non-negative. And so A or B applies. Right, so the second part of this theorem says that we are assuming these hypotheses on the, the curvatures of M, we, we assume they are bounded below. So the scalar curvature of M and the mean, the mean curvature of the boundary are bounded below. Then if, if sigma has index one, then that functional I defined some slides ago, called, I called I theta, which is this definition here, I recall you, is also less than a topological constant only depends on the genus and the number of boundary components of sigma. And I should remark that this inequality is strict. And a, an interesting question to make is, what is the supremum of I theta of sigma if we vary sigma over all minimal capillary immersions of index one inside of M? Is it is this supreme equal uh, if, uh, if we fix also the topological type of sigma? Is this supremum equal to this number in the right hand side? Or is the supremum is less than this number? This is a question for you. And finally, the third part says that if we have a scalar curvature bounded away from zero 
and we have uh, weekly mean convex boundary, then we have two options for uh, the area of sigma when it has low index. If, if sigma is stable, then actually it's a disk, it's diffeomorphic to a disk, and its area is bounded above by a multiple of the inverse of the scalar curvature. Uh, and if sigma has index equal to one, then there's not much to say about the topological type, but the area of sigma is bounded above by its topology. So this is interesting. Uh, it's an interesting bound because some compactness resource for minimal surfaces require uh, area bounds. And this shows that if we prescript the topological type, we have area bounds for uh, surf minimal surfaces of index one, for instance. So let me give you uh, the proof of this theorem as catch as always of the proof. And it's basically an application of what is called the Hirsch streak. And I think it's very good for you to remember uh, what, what is this Hirsch streak, which is very common nowadays to use in many results that appear in the literature. And this is a lemma. A very beautiful lemma it comes from complex analysis and differential geometry, of course, and says the following. So suppose we have sigma bar, a uh, closed and orientable Riemannian surface of some genus uh, gamma, and we have uh, any non-negative smooth function, and I call it H. Then the, the lemma says that uh, there exists a conformal map I call it F bar from sigma bar to the sphere, the round sphere, such that it's L2 orthogonal to that initial function H. And moreover, this is also, this is not the most interesting part, but the most interesting part is that F bar has bounded degree. Uh, this bounded degree in terms of the topology of sigma bar. So F bar has degree less than or equal to the integer part of gamma plus three over two. So this is a, the called a Hirsch trick. So we mainly, the, the proof of this mainly uses that the uh, the, the conformal group of the sphere is large enough so that we can compose uh, any map F with some, some conformal change of the sphere so that it's L2 orthogonal to the initial function H. Okay, so how do we apply this to prove, for instance, item one of theorem C? So uh, this is how we do. We fix H to be the first eigenfunction of this elliptic problem here, which is the eigenvalue problem for the Jacobi operator with this special boundary condition. This is a problem which is linked to the stability inequality. So if we if we glue disks on the boundary of sigma, this would give you would give us a, a compact orientable surface sigma bar. And I'm using this notation A in sigma bar just to refer to the usage of the previous lemma. So by the previous lemma, there exists the conformal map F bar from sigma bar to the round sphere, which is L2 orthogonal to H, which is the first eigenfunction of this problem. And such that the, the degree of F bar is bounded above by this quantity here. So uh, just restrict F bar to sigma and call it F. It has three components. We are seeing S2 as inside R3. And since uh, sigma has index one uh, and these each Fi here is orthogonal to the first eigenfunction, then we know that this quantity here, which is the index form applied to each fi is non-negative. 
This is by the fact that sigma has index equal to one. So now we sum over i, and we observe that the sum of fi squared over i is just equal to one because f lies on the sphere. The codomain of f is the sphere. So we have this inequality here. So uh, we are assuming some hypothesis on the Ricci curvature and uh, of, of the ambient manifold. And so we have to control this, this energy, uh, energy term here, the, the L2 norm of the, the, of the gradient of F. So how do we do this? We use a conformality of F bar. So this integral here is of course, less than this integral over sigma bar. And by the conformality of F, this is equal to two times the area of the image, uh, which is, let me slide this, which is two times the area times the degree of F by usual different, uh, differential geometry. And we know that the degree of F is bounded, bounded above by, the, by its topology of sigma. So we have this bound for the gradient. Okay, therefore, we know that the previous inequality turns into this inequality here. And so we use the Gauss equation um, and the hypothesis of the non-negativeness of Ricci curvature and the mean curvature of the boundary to obtain the, the, this next inequality here. So it involves the Gaussian curvature of sigma. So if we have an integral of Gaussian curvature, we can straight away apply the gauss bonnet theorem. So we obtain this inequality here. And this, this integral of Q can be substituted by applying this identity that I mentioned uh, some slides ago, uh, involving the, the function Q and the geodesic curvature of the boundary. So we just apply this identity and rearrange and we obtain that the total geodesic curvature of the boundary of sigma is bounded above by this quantity, which only depends on the topology of sigma, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this uh, is a good trick to remember her trick. I want to, to leave this uh, this video with this message. The Hirsch trick is very important in, in this sort of way, for instance, how to apply it for, to, to, to have a, an interesting result. Great. So the proof of the second item of the theorem follows the same lines uh, using Hirsch trick, but we now uh, use a different hypothesis we have. Uh, and the proof of the last item of theorem C actually follows from uh, the first theorem we presented, uh, because if sigma is stable, then we can apply theorem A. And theorem A says that if you have bound a, a scalar curvature with this, which is bounded, uh, bounded below and away from zero, uh, then sigma must have positive Euler characteristic. And if, the, if this is the case, then it has, to, it has to be a disk. Or if for item uh, two, uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, if sigma has index one, we just apply the, the, previ the previous item, item two of uh, theorem C. So this is all I had to say for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed the talks um, and thank you very much for watching. And thanks again for Hojo Lee for this wonderful initiative to create this geometric analysis festival. Bye.